Stephen, this is John. I see your got your technical assist or technical issues worked out. Let's try to do a sound check with you. Okay, fine. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can't hear you. That's good. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have two o'clock. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, obviously, this presentation is on the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief, or ESSER 3 fund, as part of the American Rescue Plan. Um, this is being recorded. It will be sent out to both the attendees and those that could not attend afterwards. Um, it will also uh, include the presentation slides. Uh, for those that are attending and those that were unable to attend. And we will also take questions uh, throughout this presentation through either the chat function or the Q&A function. So you can ask those along the way, and we will address those after, in writing after the presentation concludes. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who's uh, one of our deputy superintendents, Dr. John Payne. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for your time and joining um, again as we talk about a new emergency relief program, um, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief, or ESSER 3 fund. The purpose of these sessions is to provide an overview of the American Rescue Plan Act and specifically the funds provided by it under the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief, or ESSER 3 funds, that will be awarded to school districts as subgrants. As always, our disclaimer is that this presentation is designed to help you understand state requirements and procedures for this significant amount of emergency relief funds, but is not a substitute for reading the grant agreement, all assurances, terms, and conditions, and all the applicable state laws and federal regulations that govern these funds. The objectives today is to provide you an overview of the ESSER 3 and subgrant requirements, to give you an understanding of the ESSER 3 funds, including our responsibilities as well as district responsibilities, to understand financial and auditing requirements and information about these ESSER 3 funds, uh, to understand auditing components uh, with these funds and to understand your grant award notification and other legal requirements. I will be joined today by a number of colleagues here from the South Carolina Department of Education uh, who have been integral in uh, working and managing all of these federal funds and we will be presenting information to you as we go forward. Today's session is going to be one of a series of technical assistance sessions that the Department of Education provides. Because of the amount of the money that is being provided through ESSER 3, we decided to break it up into what we hope is much more manageable components. So today's session is going to provide you extensive information on all the requirements of ESSER 3. We will provide additional technical assistance sessions uh, on uh, completing the ESSER 3 application and plan, as well as a return to in-person plan, both of which we will talk about in today's sessions. And these sessions will be posted to our ESSER 3 website, and we will give you that website when we get to the end of our presentation today. So let's kick off with some general information about the American Rescue Plan Act. Back in March, uh, on March 11th, the American Rescue Plan, or ARP, Act was signed into law. And through this act, the U.S. Department of Education is providing an additional $122 billion for the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Fund, or ESSER 3. As you all know, last March in 2020, Congress passed the CARES Act which provided about $216 million in emergency relief in what was then called ESSER. Back in December, the SIRSA Act was passed. It provided an additional $940 million to South Carolina. And now this March, March 2021, we have the American Rescue Plan Act. As they have done with all other emergency programs, the U.S. Department of Education is awarding grants to state education agencies 
for the purpose of providing local educational agencies or school districts with emer emergency relief funds to address the impact that COVID-19 has had and continues to have on elementary and secondary schools. Under ARP or under the ARP Act, districts will have to complete two separate plans. And we're going to take these individually in our presentation with you today. The first of these is the ESSER 3 application and budget and the ESSER 3 plan. So that is the first plan uh, that uh, districts will have to complete. The second plan that districts have to complete is a return to in-person instruction plan. And again, we're gonna take these in order beginning here in a moment with the ESSER 3 application and then go into the in-person or the return to in-person plan. It's important to know that there are differences, even though there are a lot of similarities, there are nevertheless differences between the emergency funds that we have received so far. The CARES Act authorized ESSER 1, and the period of availability uh, is September 30th, 2022. In that fund, there were 12 allowable uses of funds, and you have to track those separately. Then we have ESSER 2 that was authorized by the SIRSA Act. Those funds have to be spent by September 30th, 2023. There were 15 allowable uses, including new uses for capital improvements and learning loss mitigations, again, needing to be tracked separately. And lastly, in the point of today's session, there is the uh, ESSER 3 authorized by the ARP Act. These funds have to be expended by September 30th, 2024. There are 15 allowable uses within these funds, plus districts must uh, do an in-person plan, publish an in-person plan online, and spend at least 20% of their ESSER 3 funds on activities to address learning loss. Within all three of these programs, even though there are a lot of similarities, the funds must be tracked separately from the other ESSER funds. So let's go into the ESSER plan requirements. School districts are going to be receiving subgrants, and those subgrants are based on the state FY21, which was the allocations from summer of 2020, Title I allocations. Uh, it's the exact same mathematics that we did with ESSER 1 and ESSER 2, except for ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, we're using the amounts that were made available under Title I in summer of 2020. So we, we ran those calculations and those amounts are now posted on our ESSER 3 webpage. Under ESSER 3, South Carolina will receive a total of $2,112,051,487 in ESSER 3 funds. A significant, significant amount of money. And we cannot underscore enough how important it is to use these funds wisely and make sure that every penny of these funds uh, is allowable, reasonable, necessary, and meets all the requirements. 90% of these ESSER funds, a little over $1.9 billion, will be flowing through to school districts in the form of subgrants. The remaining 10%, about $211 million, will be used for state-level activities to address issues caused by COVID-19. So under ESSER 3, districts will be required to complete a new application and plan in addition to submitting a budget, a GEPA statement, and a signed grant award for ESSER 3 funds. Districts are not required to use any of these ESSER 3 funds for equitable services to non-public, non-profit schools. That is again put uh, at the responsibility of the state for doing that. Uh, and again, as I mentioned a moment ago, moment ago, ESSER 3 funds extend until September 30th, 2024. That is the date by which all ESSER 3 funds must be spent. Funds cannot be used on subsidizing or offsetting executive salaries and benefits of individuals who are not district employees 
or expenditures related to state or local teacher or faculty unions or associations. And please be reminded that within these ESSER funds, the supplement not supplant does not apply to these funds. Supplement not supplant did not apply to ESSER 1, does not apply to ESSER 2, and does not apply to ESSER 3. However, districts should ensure that the funds are spent on activities related to caused by or impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's talk about some of the learning loss. School districts must reserve at least 20% of their total allocation on activities to address learning loss. In doing so, school districts activities should align or duplicate what you're already putting together and submitting for your academic recovery plan. As you know, we are uh, districts are submitting academic recovery plans to the department that outlines goals and strategies that you will be implementing to accelerate learning and to address learning for students that have been most impacted by COVID-19. Rather than have you come up with new goals and new strategies, we ask that you align it or duplicate in the learning law sec section of your ESSER 3 plan, those same goals and activities and strategies that you're using uh, for your academic recovery plan. The ESSER 3 plan must include how you are going to use funds to address the academic impact of lost instructional time using evidence-based interventions. How you will ensure that those interventions respond to the social, emotional, and academic needs of students, and how you will ensure that the interventions uh, that you implement addresses all of the students' needs, and that includes those students that have been disproportionately impacted. Those students disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 could be students that have lost instructional time, students who have not been engaged, but also and should include students of our varying subgroups. So students from low income families, students of color, our English learners or multi-language learners, children with disabilities, students experiencing homelessness, children in foster care and migratory students. So 20% of your ESSER 3 funds must be spent on implementing evidence-based interventions and activities to address the learning loss of students and accelerate their learning so as to uh, mitigate the negative impact caused by COVID-19. There are other categories that you can use the remaining funds. Uh, again, you must budget at least 20%. You can budget more than 20%. But of the remaining funds that you have after you decide how much you're going to budget and spend for learning loss, you can use funds for any activities authorized under the Every Student Succeeds Act, including the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act, the Perkins Act. You can use funds to coordinate emergency response, address the needs of highly vulnerable populations, use funds to ensure preparedness and coordination of systems and procedures, use the funds to provide training related to infectious diseases or to purchase cleaning supplies to sanitize and clean schools. You can use the funds for planning and coordinating for continued education. You can use the funds to purchase educational technology, provide mental health supports, address summer learning, address learning loss, for school facility repairs and improvements, for improving indoor air quality, for developing strategies and implementing public health protocols, and lastly, as was in ESSER 1 and ESSER 2, any other activities that are necessary for maintaining services, employment, and instruction. On this slide, you see a hyperlink that takes you to the detailed descriptions of these 15 uh, categories. So again, 20%, at least 20% on learning loss and the rest you must budget in these other allowable uses of funds. As with ESSER 2, 
if you intend to use your ESSER, any of your ESSER 3 funds for facilities and indoor air projects, we do need you to provide extensive detail in your ESSER 3 plan and budget. That is because the department needs to determine the alteration level, whether it's a level one up through a level three. As you're thinking about using funds for facilities and indoor air projects, there are some special considerations. One, you need to make sure that these, uh, that these activities are to justify, you, that you're justifying it by saying it is preventing, preparing for, and responding to COVID-19. Costs must be reasonable, and that applies to all of your funds. The Davis-Bacon rules apply. Uh, you cannot claim funds in this category until we have all of the full approval, so you do need to follow our Office of School Facilities procedures. And again, you must follow all EDGAR requirements on construction. With respect to the facilities, once, as we get the plans in, we will send those plans to our Office of School Facilities. If you have or are planning to use any of your ESSER 3 funds for facilities or indoor air quality projects, uh, they will then review to determine the sufficiency of information. If we need additional information, we will contact you. Uh, school facilities staff determines if the request is routine or non-routine maintenance. If it's routine maintenance, you can go forward. If it's non-routine maintenance, you will need again to follow our Office of School for, uh, Facilities procedures with submitting a plan for facility repairs and improvements. And again, as a reminder, the level, the levels of alteration, a level one alteration uh, includes the removal and replacement of the covering of existing materials using new materials that serve the same purpose. A level two alteration is reconfiguring or extending any space system, the addition or elimination of any door or window or the installation of any additional equipment. A level three is basically any level one or two where the work exceeds 50% of the building, which also includes new construction. And finally, routine maintenance or things like changing air filters, painting, and that sort of thing. Under ESSER 3, there is a new category, which is category 14, that has not been expressly uh, its own category under ESSER 1 or 2. And this is a category that allows districts to use funds to develop and implement, to develop strategies and implement public health protocols, including, to the greatest extent practicable, policies in line with guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for the reopening and operation of school facilities to effectively maintain the health and safety of students, educators, and other staff. So as part of your ESSER 3 application and plan, you will have to describe the extent to which and how funds will be used to implement prevention and mitigation strategies consistent with the most recent CDC guidance on reopening schools in order to continuously and safely open and operate schools for in-person learning, where we all know that students learn best. As you're developing your ESSER 3 plan, you have to get public input. So it is a requirement that school districts must engage in meaningful consultation with stakeholders, must give the public an opportunity to provide input during the development of the plan, and once approved, that approved ESSER 3 plan must be posted publicly on the district's website. In terms of the public input specifically, school districts must consult with students, families, school and district administrators, including special education, uh, faculty and staff, teachers, principals, school leaders, and other educators or other school staff. And if applicable, school districts must consult with civil rights organizations and stakeholders that represent student subgroups, for example, students with disabilities, if that's applicable within your school district uh, boundaries. So that is the ESSER 3 plan. What I will say is that the department is working and will soon have published a template 
that you can use to complete your ESSER 3 plan as well as your budget and we will post that and do a technical assistance session that will walk you through how to complete that ESSER 3 plan. Now let's turn to the second plan that you that school districts are required to do under the ARP and that is the return to in person plan. LEAs or school districts must publish a plan online for the safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services by June 24th, 2021, within 30 days of receiving your grant award. So on Monday, May 24th, the department will issue school districts their grant award notification for two thirds of their funds, because that's all that we have received so far is two thirds of our funds. And within 30 days of you getting that grant award, you have to publish this return to in person plan online. In developing it and prior to publishing it, you have to get public input and take public input into account as you're uh, putting it together. And we will have uh, as well a template. Uh, we, are, we have just finalized the template for the return to in person plan that we'll be sharing with school districts very soon, uh, along with some instructions on how to complete it. If you've already done a plan, it, that can be allowable if you have publicly posted the plan, if the plan meets all of the requirements and stakeholders have provided input. And again, LEAs must post this plan on their website and allow for public input uh, whether or not they've done it already or whether you still need to do it. Some other requirements with respect to the in-person plan. School districts must review and as appropriate revise the plan at least every six months. In updating and revising the plan, School districts should take into consideration significant changes to CDC guidance with opening schools in its revisions. The revised plan must address and describe any LEA adopted policies. So if the CDC changes some guidance and the district develops and implements a policy, that must be described in this revised and updated return to in-person plan. Now let's talk about some other requirements and some timelines. Under the ARP, there is something that is brand new that, um, well, that Nancy Williams will talk about here in a little bit, but I encourage you, your superintendents, CFOs, your attorneys to go and look at this particular section of the American Rescue Plan. And that is something called a maintenance of equity. We'll talk more about that, but that is an assurance that you have to agree to in receiving the funds. And one of the complexities here is that the US Department of Education has yet to put out guidance on defining what really, how they're gonna operationalize what this maintenance of equity is. In addition, uh, school districts and the state have to agree to reporting requirements for a host of things under the American Rescue Plan that includes things such as modes of instruction, whether that's in-person, hybrid, or virtual, how funds are being used to meet students' needs, particularly by subgroups, data about opportunity to learn, impacts and outcome data by subgroup, student data by subgroup on the impact that COVID-19 has had. We believe through the rally tool, we already have that, the jobs created or retained and what kind or by type, participation rates in ESSER funded activities. Uh, we'll talk more about these as we go forward, but just know there are a number of assurances and unknowns at this time about exactly how and what the U.S. Department of Education will, will require states to use. So now let's talk about some timelines and a process flow, because it's going to look a little different under ESSER 3 than it has under ESSER 1 or 2. As you know, under ESSER 1 or 2, you had to complete an application or spending plan, submit it to the department for review and approval, 
and then you got your grant award notification. That was so that the department could look on the front end to make sure that we gave feedback and input to, to, to school districts so that we could address on the front end any issues that wouldn't later become a headache on the back end. The U.S. Department of Education is requiring states, though, to expeditiously grant funds to school districts. So on May 24th, you will get your grant award notification and sub and assurances sent to you. You'll then need to sign and return your grant award and assurances back to the department, and you can begin uh, budgeting your uh, ESSER three funds in gaps and claiming it. Big, big word of caution. I'm sorry, let's go back one slide, please. I'm sorry. Big, big word of caution as you do that. Please, please, and you will hear this multiple times today, take a special care if you claim funds prior to you submitting your application. Because if you spend funds on something that's not reasonable, not necessary, not allowable, and it violates all of the requirements or the rules of ESSER 3, you will have to pay those funds back. So just know that. So grant awards will come first on May 24th. Again, 30 days later is when you have to make your reopening plan publicly available and post it to your website. And you have 90 days from the date you get your grant award or until August 24th to submit your ESSER 3 application for review and approval. Within all of this, if and as you have questions, please, please, please reach out to the department, reach out to our staff, and we will be more than happy to assist you. Because again, this is a significant amount of money, a historic amount of money, and quite frankly, a historic opportunity that done wisely will propel South Carolina forward as we continue to not only get students learning caught up but accelerated to places beyond where they were before. With that now, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleagues from the uh, Department uh, Office of Finance, Stephen Strother, to talk about uh, budgeting. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for listening in today, and we'll in the next few slides, we'll be talking about budget approval, reimbursement, and reporting, and some of the procedures specific to the ESSER 3 subgrant. So essentially, in managing the ESSER 3 subgrant, we'll be talking about some important changes for using grant, the grants accounting process, processing system known as GAPS, and some of the reporting requirements. Essentially, with your grant award notification or your GAN, it must be fully executed, which means your superintendent has to sign the subaward, which is the GAN, return the signed GAN to SCS or website noted here, and also remember to retain a copy with both signatures for your records. So some changes as far as setting up the budgeting gaps. As John mentioned, on May the 24th, budgets for all sub-recipients will be available in GAPS to be set up. So uh, be sure to look for your budget in GAPS on May the 24th, which is coming up shortly. Even though they're there, the sub-recipients are not required to enter the budgets on that day. Keep that in mind. However, the budgets must be entered in GAPS within 90 days of availability. You will have a spending plan budget summary, which in your columns will be your, uh, your functions and in your, uh, and, and the other half will be your objects, which you will actually enter based on the high level function and object groups on your spending plan. And there will be some quarterly reporting requirements. So subgrantees must report the following quarterly. The amount of subgrant funds expended for each authorized activity at both the detail and the fun uh, function and the object level. So keep that in mind. The amount expended in the 
is the amount claimed during a reported period. So in other words, if you've claimed during a quarter, that is the amount that you will actually report uh, on the reporting template. Please note also that there uh, may be some changes to this to come in accordance with the U.S. Department of Education reporting requirements and also the South Carolina General Assembly. So please keep that in mind that there may be some changes forthcoming and we will keep you informed of those changes. Some reporting due dates. These are consistent with the uh, CARES Act and ESSER II reporting due dates. Keep these uh, dates in mind. Uh, for the quarters, April 1st through June 30th, your reporting due date deadline is July the 5th. July the 1st through September the 30th, your reporting deadline is October the 5th. October 1st through December the 31st, your reporting deadline is January the 5th. And let me just reiterate before I go into the last deadline that these are the actual claims that you have submitted during those quarters. And for January the 1st through March 31st, your reporting deadline is April the 5th. And so please notify the Department of Education if you are going to uh, have any trouble meeting those reporting deadlines. And with that, um, I, will I will turn it over to Nancy Williams to go over the revenue codes, allowability, time and effort, and maintenance of equity procedures for ESSER three. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you are aware, um, next slide, please, Caroline. As you are aware, um, the funds for ESSER should be accounted for and tracked separately um, from the other two ESSER awards, just as John previously stated. Um, therefore, we have established a new revenue code and sub fund, Revenue code 4974 and sub fund 218 should be used to track and report the receipt and use of ESSER $3. As John previously stated, because you will gain access to these ESSER 3 funds in gaps prior to submitting an application or spending plan, and obtaining approval for your plan activities, it is very important that you proceed with caution and ensure any costs charged to the award are allowable in accordance with the American Recovery Plan, the Uniform Grant Guidance um, requirements, as well as SEDE's assurances in terms and conditions. Um, so in order for you to, do, for a cost to be allowable, under ESSER 3, it must be necessary, reasonable, and allocable, as well as adequately documented. A cost is considered to be reasonable if it doesn't exceed that which would be incurred by a prudent person if they had the same level of detail and um, under the same circumstances prevailing at the time when that decision was made to incur the cost. So it's something that a prudent person would do. Um, as a reminder, your district must have written procedures for determining the allowability of costs. I know we've discussed that previously in other um, presentations. And then if you um, have any questions, as John stated, related to whether a cost can be charged to the SO3 award, please just ask. Um, you can always email the ESSER. Um, inbox, the email box uh, with questions or just reach out to us individually. Um, remember, this is not one of those times when you have you can have the mindset of it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Um, as you will hear over and over today, you will be audited on the use of these funds, not only by your independent auditor, but also by the SEDE and potentially even by the federal government. Um, so any costs that are determined to be unallowable um, because they're not necessary or they're unreasonable or they lack proper documentation could result in the payment of funds. As it relates to time and effort, all employees who are paid in part or in full with federal funds must complete time and effort documentation. 
to reflect the effort spent on each grant activity and cost objective. Now, this requirement applies to full-time and part-time employees, as well as substitute teachers, if they run through payroll and are considered employees. This requirement does not apply to those that are truly considered contractors. So in general, a personnel activity report should be used to track time charge for multiple cost objectives and a semi-annual certification should be used to track time that is 100% charged to a cost objective. So a PAR should be completed monthly, be an after the fact distribution of time, and signed by the employee and the supervisor. So remember that ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3 are all separate cost objectives. Each district should have a procedure in place um, that will address how you compensate employees during emergency situations. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to develop it as we went through and awarded funds for ESSER 2, please make sure that you go back and you create an emergency pay plan procedure um, to account for um, what was happening as you were attempting to keep people on payroll during this pandemic. As a reminder, Time and effort must be supported by a system of internal controls, which provide reasonable assurance that charges are accurate, allowable, and allocable. And those controls <clears throat> in place must be documented. Okay, so the documentation of time and effort must be accurate and reasonably reflect the total activity for which employees are compensated. So that's from all sources, um, federal and non-federal sources. There should also be a periodic reconciliation of actual effort to the funding source, which in this instance is ESSER 3. I know while time and effort may be, re may be viewed um, by some as burdensome or something that's done at the last minute to kind of check a box, it is very important that you diligently comply with these requirements because failure to do so could not only result in audit findings since time and effort is the proverbial low hanging fruit, but it could also result in significant repayment of federal funds. Um, in recent years, some higher education entities across the country have had to repay millions and millions of dollars um, due to a failure failure to adequately uh, maintain time and effort documentation. So please take this very seriously. And as John uh, mentioned, um, under um, the ARP um, in the past, while there was no local maintenance of effort requirement for ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3, like there is for other federal programs such as IDEA, ESSER 3 introduces a new requirement called maintenance of equity for high poverty schools. The U.S. Department of Education has yet to release detailed guidance on this, um, but from the statute, we are able to determine that in state fiscal year 22 and state fiscal year 23, districts will have to comply with this requirement. Um, there appear to be two compliance points under maintenance of equity one that relates to a reduction in per pupil funding and the other related to a reduction in per pupil full-time equivalent staff. So under both of the compliance points, neither the per pupil funding, which is combined as, as considers the combination of state and local funding, nor the per pupil FTE for any high poverty school in a district can be reduced by an amount that exceeds the total reduction in the district divided by the number of students enrolled in the district. So it's that proportion. You can't reduce um, those items in those high poverty schools um, by an amount that exceeds um, the overall percentage. Again, once we receive additional guidance from the U.S. Department of Education, we will provide additional information concerning maintenance of effort requirements to you. Okay, that concludes my portion, and I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Myers, the Director of the Office of Auditing Services, um, to discuss auditing issues. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, as Nancy said, I'm Melissa Myers, Director from the Office of Auditing Services, and I would like to talk to you about some audit issues and documentation requirements for the ESSER program. When auditors determine which federal programs to audit each year, they have to look at several risk factors to determine which programs will be major programs. Some factors in the major program determination include the dollar amount of funds expended for the program and whether the program is a relatively new program. So being as if the ESSER 3 program as well as your ESSER 1 and 2 programs are all fairly new programs with a high dollar amount being expended, it is very highly likely or certain that your ESSER um, funds will be audited by your independent auditors. If you expend any funds for ESSER 3 um, prior to June 30 of this year, you will be subject to audit during the fiscal year 2020, 21 single audits that your um, auditor should be beginning to plan for. In addition to your independent auditors coming out to audit your ESSER 3 program, here at the SCDE, our Office of Auditing Services and our new Office of Emergency Program staff will also perform fiscal monitoring of the district's use of ESSER grant funds. And um, in addition to fiscal monitoring, some programmatic monitoring also will be conducted as well. Annually, our office issues a document that's called the Guidelines Memo for returning, Retaining Documentation to Support Expenditures. We share this with our federal program directors each year and we ask them to share it with our subrecipients. So annually, you should be receiving a copy of this memo and it also is on our website and I will um, share the link with you in a later slide where you can access this memo. In this memo, it tells you exactly what types of supporting documentation should be maintained for the various expenditures that are being claimed for your ESSER program and any other federal program. If your claim is for payroll and employee benefits, we expect to see items such as timesheets for your hourly employees, your personnel activity reports, for any employee who is funded in part by the ESSA program, semi-annual certifications, if you have any employees that's being funded solely by the ESSA program. We also request that you send us payroll registers, your labor history reports, a salary agreement so that we can see um, what your, these employees should actually be paid, as well as a job description so that we can see what duties these employees should be performing. And for the fringe benefits, a documentation of the various rates that you're um, charging for the benefits, your federal and tax forms that have been submitted to pay for these various employee benefits, and invoices. If your claim is for purchase services, we expect to see a contractual agreement between you, the subrecipient, and whatever, um, whatever, whomever the contractor is. In the contractual agreement, we should see items such as the exact period of performance or the dates of the contract, a detailed description of services to be rendered under the contract, the amount to be paid under the contract and also the payment terms such as monthly, quarterly, annual payments or payments being made upon a completion of work, etc. We also look for authorized signatures on your contract, any invoices to support the payments that have been made, and again, time sheets to support the amount of time worked by the contractor. If you have claimed supplies under the ESSA grant, then we want to see documentation, documentation such as your purchase orders, purchase requisitions, invoices or receipts, um, goods receipts, 
or your packing slips to show when the documents or goods were actually received. If you're claiming indirect costs, then we also um, expect to see a calculation of how you came up with the amount to charge for your indirect costs, a journal entry in your general ledger to show the actual um, charge for the indirect costs, and documentation of the approved indirect cost rate or the negotiation agreement that you would have in place with between our office and the school district. And like all other federal funds, all capital assets purchased with ESSER 3 funds must be inventoried. Low value technology assets such as your laptops must also be inventory. We know that um, with the pandemic, lots of Chromebooks, um, laptops, other technology devices were purchased for use by both students and teachers. And we want to make sure that you are adequately tracking these types of information, this type of inventory, these type of purchases for with your ESSER dollars. Now, the next topic I want to talk to you briefly on is indirect costs. So what are indirect costs? Indirect costs must meet two criteria. First, they are incurred for a common or joint purpose benefiting more than one cost objective and they are not readily assignable to the cost object objectives specifically benefited, but we do know that they do benefit the various programs. Some examples of indirect cost functions include your accounting services, auditing services, budgeting, payroll, personnel, and purchasing. And again, these are examples of but if you have an accountant that's you know solely for the S3 program, then that person would be a direct um cost. But so an accountant that you know handles several different programs will be a cop an example of an indirect cost. We calculate two types of indirect costs at the department for use by school districts, an unrestricted rate and a restricted rate. And the difference between the two is that the restricted rate is used for programs with the supplement not supplant provision, whereas the unrestricted rate is used for programs without the supplement not supplant provision. ESSER funds are not subject to supplement not supplant, therefore districts are allowed to charge the unrestricted rate for your ESSER 3 and other ESSER programs. Um, the unrestricted rate is just the maximum rate that could be charged. You can charge a lower rate if you want to, but make sure that you do not double dip, which means you're charging an expenditure as a direct cost and then turning around and claiming as an indirect cost, also a cost which should only be an indirect cost or a direct cost. And I mentioned earlier that I would share with you um, the link to where you can find our guidelines memo. And this is the link where the guidelines memo uh, is on our website. And again, it's a very specific document. It tells you exactly what types of information you should be retaining. And we expect to see when we come out for audits or various monitoring visits. And we also have a link here to our website where uh, various indirect cost resources are also there's a general information memo there's a copy of the approved indirect cost rates by districts and various other resources that can be found on this link also for, for indirect costs so i would now turn it over to audrey shiflett from our grants program and harry gunter from our office of general counsel Thank you very much, Melissa. Hi, everyone. I'm Audrey Shiplett, and as Melissa mentioned here, Henry Gunther will be assisting me in presenting to you today on um, details of the subaward agreement and the assurances that are required for ESSER 3 and the GEPA statement. 
So just want to begin with our disclaimer that what we're going to present to you is in no way a substitution for reading your subgrant award and all related information um, about instructions and um, the assurances and the agency's assurances in terms and conditions for set federal subawards. So the SR3 subaward format looks a little different. Um, if you remember the SR2 subaward, it looked a little different. SR3 will look just like the SR2. It reflects the new regulations that we're under, having received this new American Rescue Plan Act funding after November 12th, 2020. One new item is the budget period in addition to the period of performance. And as you see, the ending date is September 30th, 2024 for the last time that you can uh, use those funds for expenditures. Also, like in ESSER 2, the details of the subgrant includes the amount of funds being awarded to your district, the total amount of funds being obligated, and the total amount of funds committed to your district. For your first ESSER 2 award, all of these items will reflect the same amount. The scope of work is now section 11 of the sub award and it spans five pages and includes details on the allowable uses of funds, specifically the 20% of funds that must be used for learning loss. Also program requirements, required actions and deadlines for reporting and other deadlines. The next few slides detail the new domestic preference for procurement regulation. We are required to include this language in sub awards for funds we've received since November 12th, 2020. So you will continue to see this regulation in new sub awards going forward into the next fiscal year. Here you see the definitions in the GAN as what produced in the United States means and also what manufactured products means. So there's no question of what is meant by those terms. And this language is directly taken from the regulations as we must do. Next slide. because the regulations require us to include this in all sub awards and also in contracts and purchase orders. Likewise, you must include the language in contracts and purchase orders for work or products under the ESSER 3 sub award. This will be item 11P in your sub grant and you need to update your procurement policies and processes to ensure a domestic preference and it is a preference just your process for how you're going to ensure that you're doing that at this point i want to remind you of a few things and echo some of the things that you've already heard during this session understand that although these ESSER 3 funds can be used in a manner similar to your previous SC CARES Act ESSER funds and the SURSA ESSER 2 funds, all of these subgrants are distinct and they are all authorized under different federal legislation. So you must track them all separately from each other and also separate from any other funds that your district is receiving. And it's also important for you to understand how they differ and what applies to each subgrant because there are differences and nuances. Please um, remember that you have to keep your district SAM.gov registration current in order to continue to receive federal funds. 
that's a contractual obligation when you sign the GAN and begin to get funds. And also, if your registration lapses, we have to stop your federal subgrant funds because it's basically against federal law for us to continue to give you funds. We encourage you to set an internal control because that SAM registration expires and it must be re renewed annually. So you want to have an internal control to ensure that you renew your SAM registration before it expires because you don't want to get notified by our Office of General Counsel that your SAM registration has expired and you're not going to get federal funds until you come back into compliance. Also, it should go without saying, but because you're about to receive the most federal funds your district has ever received, be sure to follow best practices for grants management. Some of these include, next slide, first in, first out, meaning that you should spend your oldest subgrant funds first. Now we realize that you have a requirement of spending 20% of your ESSER three funds um, for learning loss. Understanding that all of these are emergency funds, the CARES Act, the ESSER one and ESSER two, they really should be prioritized to move them um, out as soon as possible. But just be mindful that with your CARES Act funds and your ESSER two, um, try to expend those as expeditiously as you can so that you don't have just little amounts lingering out there because you're just focused on the huge amount of your ESSER three funds. Also, as Melissa just explained, you have to document, document, document all of your expenditures and by federal regulation you're supposed to document all components of your procurement processes and have that on hand too for when a monitor or a an auditor comes in and asks to see it maintain strong internal controls as nancy mentioned to you um, these are just some examples here on this slide, but just a reminder about inventory control. If you are purchasing supplies with federal funds, that they're called supplies because they fall under that threshold for considering them equipment, but you know it's a supply like maybe an iPad or another tablet device that's at high risk of theft, you will want to inventory that. Anything that is of high risk of walking away, be sure that you're inventorying that and you have a way to know where it is. And have procedures in place for re routinely reviewing your, your internal controls, your processes and processes and procedures and updating them as needed. Be sure to communicate regularly with your personnel, your principals, anyone in your district who's going to be using these funds so that they know the formal processes and procedures that they are supposed to be using, that they know how they're supposed to be retaining the documentation, that they know what checks and balances that you have in place so that everybody's on the same page and you don't end up in a situation where a monitor walks in and asks for something and no one knows how to provide it to them. Next slide. So a big recommendation we have for you is we strongly encourage you to adopt the 2020 model school district procurement code um, when the uh, state Office of Procurement has approved that. That's the State Fiscal Account Authority, Accountability Authority. They have the code on their website. If you haven't reviewed it yet, you can find it here. When they approve it, which we're expecting later this summer, it will supersede the previous version of the model school district code. It's important because it consolidates in or incorporates into it changes that state procurement has made to try to better align with federal regulations.
Also, it will provide you with a written policy um, as is required by federal regulations and and just be mindful that with all of this federal emergency money that we have been flowing through to your district, you will be subject to the federal audit requirement um, and the model code will allow your district to benefit from the new thresholds for flexibility and procurement that are allowable under the federal regulations. Next slide. So one issue is with the flexibilities under the federal regulations and how state procurement has to approve your procurement code, um, one way to ensure that you will be able to benefit from the flexibilities in the federal regulations is to adopt this 2020 model code, which aligns to it. Next slide. So one reason for all of this is the auditor will be coming between now and September 2024 or even beyond that to look at how you have been managing your funds. So having strong internal controls, documenting everything, inventorying your equipment and high risk supplies, all of that will help you stay prepared for when the auditor shows up. As a reminder, you should have update, updated your policies and procedures for how your district operated during 2020 during the national emergency due to COVID. The US Department of Education issued guidance in April 2020 stating that it's possible for you to amend an existing policy or create a new policy and that these can be done after the fact and retroactive to the date of the national emergency declaration due to COVID-19, which was March 13th, 2020. Next slide. Now, as Nancy mentioned, you must have a procedure written on how you determine that it's allowable to use federal funds for an expenditure. So you need a version of that that demonstrates how those decisions and determinations were made during 2020 when your district may have been operating remotely, your schools may have been virtual, how those things rolled out. Next slide. There are also other policies and procedures that may have been affected. Um, these have to be in writing, but you may need an emergency version of them to reflect how things were done in 2020. Next slide. We included information about this in the December 2020 finance, finance newsletter and the January 2021 finance newsletter. So we're sure that many of you have already taken action on this. So congratulations. If you have not, you're going to want to prioritize this because the auditors will ask for these when they come to audit for 2020. In addition, because the Federal Office of Management and Budget updated federal regulations that went into effect in November 2020, you must update your policies and procedures to reflect these new federal regulations. Earlier this month, the OMB published new FAQs. We'll have a link to that in the May financial newsletter. Um, and one of the questions that they addressed was regarding whether you should update your policies and procedures to account for the revisions in um, 2 CFR Part 200 and other parts of uh, Title II of the Code of Federal Regulation. And they answered with yes you must update your internal policies and procedures to reflect the changes in the uniform guidance upon accepting a federal award made on or after the effective date. You've, many of you, uh, I think 
probably all of you have received S or two, and that subaward comes under these new regulations, as does S or three. So start updating your policy and policies and procedures in addition to the emergency version for the new fiscal year. I have a link here to a red line document that was produced last August when the changes were first announced and it will allow you to see what was stricken from the previous version of the regulations and what new language has been added, which might make your updates faster. At this time, I'm going to hand things over to my colleague, Henry Gunter in the Office of General Counsel, and he will take you through the ESSER 3 assurances. Thank you very much, Audrey, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, happy to have the opportunity to speak with everyone. Uh, my name is Henry Gunter. I'm an attorney with the South Carolina Department of Education's Office of General Counsel. And I'm going to be speaking with you this afternoon about assurances and GEPA statements. Um, if we can flip back to that last slide. Uh, I like this little language right here in the slide of promises to keep because at the end of the day that's what an assurance really is is an assurance is a promise to comply with certain conditions um, that come along with the disbursement of federal money that because you are receiving this money you are incurring obligations as a result of it um, at the outset of the presentation, Dr. Payne noted that this is a significant or historic amount of money and it stands to reason that there are some new and perhaps more extensive assurances than we are used to seeing. All of these assurances substantively tie in with those portions of the law that we've been talking about. Next slide, please. So there is an element of haste here, that time is of the essence because these are emergency relief funds. Um, just to remind everyone of the timeline here, and we've already discussed aspects of it, um, the American Rescue Plan was enacted on March 11th of this year. The state allocations were announced on March 17th. On March 24th, the two-thirds was awarded uh, of the South Carolina award um, was distributed to the South Carolina Department of Education and on May 24th that allocation will then pass through to the LEAs and that again that May 24th date is the date where the SEA must allocate the American Rescue Plan funds to the LEAs. It's important to remember that the ESSER 3 subgrant is not free money. Unless you're lucky enough to find a dollar on the sidewalk, there really is no such thing as free money. Um, federal grants and subgrants come with these strings attached that are called assurances. And again, these assurances are obligations on the part of the grantee as a condition of receiving and utilizing those funds. There are two types of assurances. There are the assurances in terms and conditions for federal subawards. Those are applicable to any subaward. They're something that everyone should be familiar with, but it's a great idea to review them again as a refresher. There are also program specific assurances that are passed through to the LEAs as part of the American Rescue Plan's ESSER um, language. Um, I think, again, it's important to remember that this is um, the biggest subaward um, ever that you will have received from us. And so, again, I, I think that's why you're going to see um, these detailed, unique assurances. So there are five assurances at play here, and we're going to go through them um, one by one in just a second here. You're going to receive three things. You're going to receive your grant award notification. You're going to receive a document with the assurances in terms and conditions for federal subawards. 
and you're going to receive those program-specific um, assurances. Um, with those documents, it's an entirely separate document that you're going to need to submit, and both the superintendent and financial official of the district are going to need to sign and date them. The first assurance ties back to the allowable activities that were discussed by Dr. Payne earlier in the presentation. So as the first assurance, the LEA is certifying that they will use the ARP ESSER funds for allowable activities that are enumerated under Section 2001E of the law. The second assurance is this new requirement that we've been talking about, and we do not have any detailed guidance from the U.S. Department of Education yet, but it relates to the maintenance of equity provision that is found in Section 2004C of the Rescue Plan. Um, the maintenance of equity, as was mentioned earlier, um, relates to high poverty schools where there's the requirement that you cannot disproportionately reduce maintenance of equity in high poverty schools in fiscal year 2022 or 2023. There are exceptions to this, and I think we're going to learn a little bit more about some of the discretionary aspects of that as time goes on. But the exceptions apply if the LEA meets one of the following criteria. Either the district has less than 1,000 students, the district operates only one school, the district serves all students within a particular grade span at one school, and such LEA demonstrates exceptional circumstances as determined by the Secretary of Education. And that last one, I think, is where hopefully we get a little bit of a fuller picture over time because the U.S. Department of Education is reserving that discretion of um, an additional exception or additional circumstances where an LEA might not need to comply with that maintenance of equity provision. The third assurance relates to the learning loss provision that was discussed by Dr. Payne. Um, as part of the third assurance, the LEA is certifying that they will reserve not less than 20% of the total ARP ESSER allocation to address learning loss through the implementation of evidence-based interventions. I want to highlight the language right here, such as, because I, I think that is something that everybody needs to pay attention to. It is the legislators, it is the U.S. Department of Education signaling that the following list isn't going to be exhaustive, that these are um, exceptional examples of um, compliant um, interventions, however, it is not an exhaustive list. The examples that are listed are summer learning or summer enrichment, extended days, comprehensive after-school programs, extended school year programs, or other evidence-based interventions, and to ensure that such interventions respond to that critical component of students' academic, social, and emotional needs. Um, these are the aspects that are explicitly stated in the legislation, and so, again, I, I think it's going to be interesting as time unfolds and we learn a little bit more about how the U.S. Department of Education is exercising their discretion and um, what they are allowing versus disallowing. The fourth assurance, um, the, the first aspect is really that 30 days is something that I want to highlight. So within that 30-day time period, the LEA is going to need to develop and make publicly available a plan for the safe return of in-person instruction and continuity of services. Um, or develop and make publicly available on the LEA's website um, a plan that meets the statutory requirements. Um, something that I, I want to note is that this is going to be tying back to the plan template that you're going to be receiving um, that was referenced earlier. 
Another note about Assurance 4, it's also imposing the requirement that the LEA will, as required by the rescue plan, before making the plan publicly available, seek and consider public comment and to take that public comment into consideration in the development of the plan. The fifth assurance ties back to reporting, and so it's going to impose various reporting requirements on the LEA. Um, something that I want to note is that these are federal um, dictates. These, these aren't um, dictated by the SEA. So the first certification is going to be that the LEA will comply with all reporting requirements at such time and in such manner and containing such information as the secretary, and again, that's the uh, secretary of education, so that's how they're telling you that they are retaining the discretion rather than the SEA um, may reasonably require, including on matters such as, so again, you have that such as language signaling that this is intended to be a thorough list, but not necessarily an exhaustive list. One of the examples is how the LEA is developing strategies and implementing public health protocols, including to the greatest extent practicable policies and plans in line with the CDC guidance related to ad addressing COVID-19 in schools. Um, one aspect of this that I want to highlight is that to the greatest extent practic practicable language, because I think where you have here a question about whether the guidance adopted by the governor and DHEC are in full compliance with CDC guidance. I, I think that is something that this approach or this criteria takes into consideration by saying that the LEAs are following the CDC guidance to the greatest extent practical, practicable where there are other state guidelines that might um, be at odds and ends with this. Another such as here is going to be overall plans and policies related to the LEA support for returning to in-person instruction and maximizing in-person instruction time, including how funds will support a return to and maximize in-person instruction time and advanced equity and inclusivity in participation in in-person instruction. Um, the, the next such as is are going to be the data on each LEA's mode of instruction, so whether the schools in the district are following a full in-person model, whether they are utilizing remote learning or following a hybrid model. Um, that is also, to my recollection, something that was required as part of ESSER 1 and 2, so it's something that hopefully everyone is familiar with at this point. Also, you're going to need to report the LEA uses of funds to meet student social, emotional, and academic needs, including through summer enrichment programming and other evidence-based interventions, and enumerate how the district is advancing equity for underserved students. More such as is would be um, reporting regarding the LEA uses of funds to sustain and support access to early childhood education programs, as well as impacts and outcomes that would be disaggregated by student subgroup through use of the Rescue Plan ESSER funding, for example, quantitative and qualitative results of the funding, including on personnel, student learning, and budgeting at the school and district level. Um, as you can see, Assurance 5 is a, a little bit wordy, but it concludes by including in the reporting requirements student data related to how the COVID-19 has affected instruction and learning, requirements under the Federal Financial Accountability Transparency Act, and we have a little bit of a catch-all here at the end with additional reporting requirements as may be necessary to ensure accountability and transparency of ARP ESSER funds, and so that's something that I think will evolve over time, and we will hopefully receive more guidance from the folks in Washington about what additional reporting requirements might be necessary. 
as you, a little bit of levity. Uh, as you can see, uh, we are building the plane a little bit as we're flying it, but um, I think time will hopefully give us all of the answers that we're looking for. So the next thing I want to talk about is a GEPA statement, which is required by Section 427 of GEPA. Um, as with all federal subawards, a GEPA statement is going to be required. Um, as you know, GEPA is all about equitable access, and so I think it's just a good reminder to go through a little bit about the requirements here. So under GEPA, um, Section 427, a um, subgrantee needs to include in its application a description of the steps the applicant proposed to take to ensure equitable access to and participation in its federally assisted program for students, teachers, and other program beneficiaries with special needs. One of the benefits of a GEPA statement and one of the advantages is that the language of the act allows the applicant discretion in developing the required description. It is something that can be based on local circumstances. I think the underlying rationale here is because the needs in Abbeville are not the same as the needs in Aiken, and so it does allow an applicant to really tailor the GEPA statement to um, their unique circumstances. There are SITS barrier, barriers to equitable access and participation. Those are gender, race, national origin, color, disability, and age. And with the GEPA statement, you are going to need to create a statement that identifies at least one of those barriers that would prevent someone from participating in an activity that would be funded by the ESSER III subgrant. You then need to explain what will be done to overcome that barrier. That explanation is going to need to align with the proposed uses of funds and activities. So, just hypothetically, let's say you were to look at disability and say that you are going to highlight that students with disabilities might be particularly affected by learning loss and then tie that into the ESSER three funded activities. Um, so that, that is just one example on how you, you can identify at least one barrier if you want to identify more than one you're certainly well within your rights to do so, and again, um, go through how the funded activity will help you overcome that barrier. Um, final thought is to be due to the high uh, volume of money that will be flowing, um, you always want to be on the lookout for fraud. If you believe that fraud is occurring, um, please contact the Office of the Inspector General. We have a link to the online complaint form there, as well as a, um, a listing of the phone number for the fraud hotline. Um, but the Office of the Inspector General is the body that investigates fraud, waste, um, misconduct and violations of state or federal law, and they will work diligently to ascertain the truth of, of any um, fraud complaints. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, before I touch on the additional resources, I know and I want to, uh, to recognize that uh, our time today, there we have presented you with an extensive amount of information, and we'll be doing more TA sessions. Um, as the old saying goes, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So today is our first bite in this massive thing called ESSER 3 that we'll all be working together over the next few years to implement. I say that to say that as we begin this work, there are going to be a lot of eyes on what we do, uh, how we spend this money, the kinds of things that we're, we're doing. So 
The degree to which we can be transparent and innovative is going to be critically important. The public is going to be looking at what we're going to do with this historic opportunity given to us, media, legislators, and so many others. So a couple of things as you're beginning to, to think about budgeting and spending and developing your ESSER three plan is to think about how it can be braided or looked in with what you maybe began with ESSER one or ESSER two. Are there things that you can expound? Have you found in your emergency fund so far uh, things that you've done that are working well that you want to continue? So just really think about uh, expanding those kinds of opportunities uh, with this ESSER three funds. Um, the caution, of course, as we've said repeatedly, is because you will have access to these funds uh, before you complete the application. Please, please, please take every caution imaginable so that if you do claim funds, um, they're going to be allowable, necessary, reasonable, and meet all the requirements because we don't want in any situation a district to have to repay the funds. Again, as a reminder for some timelines, on May 24th, you will be sent your grant award notification. Your budget uh, totals will already be loaded into gaps. Uh, you need to sign and send that, uh, that grant award notification and those assurances back to the department through our SCSR at ed.sc.gov email account. The next thing that will be queued up for you is going to be June 24th. And on June 24th, you will need to publicly post your plan for the safe return to in-person instruction uh, plan. We uh, are, have just finalized a template and we will be sharing that very quickly with school districts along with instructions on how to complete it. Uh, I'm very proud of the, the template that we've developed. We think it's easy to understand and one that you can just plop in your language get, and get public input, of course, and uh, put to the web. The next date then is going to be August 24th, and that is when your ESSER three application budget and plan will be due to us. And again, you have to make sure that you're budgeting at least, if not more than 20% of the total amount that you are getting on activities to address learning loss. And again, that will be due uh, August the 24th. Um, we will be providing some additional technical assistance sessions on the application package, the plan, the budget, the template, and we'll post that to our ESSER 3 website. You see that web page on the slide before you. We will also, uh, in sending out the in-person, uh, safe return to in-person plan template, send you instructions on how to complete that as well. So uh, to hopefully ease the, the work that you have to do. Um, and um, yeah, so a lot of things upcoming. One of the things that I just I, I want to end with is uh, as you do this, if you have questions, please email our SCS or email account or contact me or any of our other staff here. We have a historic opportunity uh, that if we can work together and use this money wisely, we have this opportunity to effectuate to not only get children's learning loss caused by COVID-19 addressed, but we have an, a historic opportunity to make significant and long lasting change in public education in South Carolina that furthers students academic performance as well as their social, emotional and mental health wellness. So we look forward to working with you uh, as we roll out ESSER 3 and continue our work under ESSER 2 and ESSER 1 as we go forward. Again, this webinar will be posted to our ESSER 3 website and questions that you have posed uh, in the chat or in the Q&A we will review those questions and uh, issue a uh, document that will also be posted on our ESSER 3 webpage. Thank you for your time, uh, and more importantly, thank you for what you continue to do for South Carolina students.